Thank you, Nick. And thanks to the Illinois Native Plant Society uh, Southern Chapter for inviting me to speak about the American snowbell bush, Styrax americanus, and their occurrences in Illinois. I'd like to mention that funding for this project was provided by the Illinois Native Plant Society survey grant, and I'm thankful for that funding. The funding also um, included a full review of Heteranthera reniformis, which is the kidney, kidney leaf mud plantain, which I will not be speaking about tonight, but I did um, update that species in, in Illinois as well. And that was an equally fun project, but the heart of the, the data really had to do with Styrax, which I will present this evening. As Nick said, my name is Chris Benda, and I'm currently coordinator of the Plants of Concern program, which is a rare plant monitoring program. We engage volunteers to help with the monitoring. This is a partnership between the Chicago Botanic Garden and Southern Illinois University. I also teach the floor of Southern Illinois in the summertime and was state president of IMPS in 2015 and 16. I was also Southern Chapter President, as I'm sure many of you remember, for 10 years. And I still edit the newsletter, which is the statewide um, newsletter, quarterly editions there. And I'm a life member at the Iliamna level, which is a little bit higher than the standard life membership amount. You can also find me online as Illinois Botanizer. I have my website listed there, IllinoisBotanizer.com, with all the social media taken care of. In particular, I have some videos on YouTube that I think may be of interest to members, so be sure to check out my YouTube channel. Additionally, on my website, I have been uploading photos from the last you know, 19 years or so of botanizing in Illinois. There's almost 1,100 entries now. It is um, definitely work in progress, but a lot of the species pages have at least photos visible. So check that out. And I do a variety of programming every year. And you can find my programming on my website under the speaking schedule. But if you want to subscribe to the mailing list, I try to send reminders. Because no matter where you live, uh, now I do a fair number of vir virtual programs like this one. And that allows people to participate no matter where they live. So I want to start by reminding everybody that we have um, natural areas in Illinois. These are high quality natural community remnants that have retained or recovered their original natural character, but need not be completely undisturbed. And we think of these as pristine grade A or nearly pristine grade B natural communities. <clears throat> and that's relevant because our conservative plant species are found in intact natural area remnants. Conservative species have a C value that is close to 10. So the current C value for Styrax americanus in Illinois is 10, which is the highest value. And that means that you're only gonna find Styrax americanus in pristine, high quality natural, com natural community remnants. Although I will say that uh, an outcome of this project um, definitely suggests that a C value of 10 is too high for this species. I definitely uh, incurred uh, occurrences that were not in totally pristine areas. I think it's still pretty high, definitely above a five, but I might I might settle on more like a seven or an eight if I was to do those numbers myself. Of course, collectively, um, the Natural Areas Inventory identified our natural area remnants called the INAI, and just 0.07% of the state is considered to be in a pristine natural condition. This is a 1979 statistic. It would be interesting to see that figure updated. We have lost some natural areas. We've actually added some for various reasons as well. And here's a map that really shows the distribution of natural areas and nature preserves in Illinois. So I wanna quick remind you of the Illinois Natural Divisions because I, I did find Styrax in a variety, uh, well, in three different natural divisions and I'll mention that later. Um, but I definitely want to um, point out that the majority of the Styrax Americanus populations were found in the coastal plain. I guess I'll say that the um, the populations did occur also in the in the um, the eastern border of Illinois in the bottomland section of the Wabash River border division, and even as far north as the Kankakee Sands section of the Grand Prairie Natural Division. 
But again, most of these Styrax americanus populations were found in the coastal plain natural division, which is highlighted in these two shades of blue. There are two sections in this natural division. You see this area highlighted in orange. Uh, that's the bottomlands section of the coastal plain division, and that is where Styrax americanus is found. These are lowlands of floodplain forests and swamps and shrub swamps and various wetland communities like that. Whereas the other section in the coastal plain natural division is actually more upland, and we call the, the Cretaceous Hills section. So no Styrax americanus in the Cretaceous Hills section, just in the bottomland section of the coastal plain natural division. So the family that Styrax is included in uh, is the Styracaceae. And in North America and in Illinois, there's just two genera that are represented in this family, Halesia and Styrax. So Halesia is the photo on the left and Styrax on the right. I will also mention that um, the, there are, in Illinois, there are uh, three species in the Styracaceae, one Halesia and two Styrax, and they are all on the Illinois Threatened and Endangered Species list because they we are in Illinois, we're on the northern edge of the, of the range for all of those. So the three members in that family in Illinois are all rare. And actually a friend of mine, a fellow botanist, Abel Kinzer, uh, wrote about seeing all of these rare members of the Styracaceae in May uh, one year, and he wrote about it for the Harbinger, which is the statewide newsletter, and that's in the summer 2018 uh, issue, which is volume 35, number two. So all of the past Harbinger issues are available on the Illinois Native Plant Society website, which is illinoisplants.org. So I encourage you to look up the summer 2018 edition and read Abel's article about chasing down all three of these rare members of the Styracaceae Illinois, in Illinois while they were flowering. So here are the species in North America. There's actually two uh, species in Halesia, Tetraptera and Diptera, and these are called the silver bells. So we'll take them here one at a time. Here's a picture of Halesia. I call it Halesia. You can call it Halesia. It's named after Stephen Hales, which is a was a pastor and uh, physician in Linnaeus's time, actually. So Linnaeus named this. So if you're if you're using a pronunciation after someone's name, then it's not unusual to pronounce their name, hence Halesia. But uh, I tend to say Halesia, which is a little more standard Latin pronunciation generally. In any event, you see they have these beautiful bell-shaped flowers that hang down. So it's, it's, it's a tree. Um, it does have pretty distinct bark when you look at it in nature, as you can see the picture of the bark there. And uh, the fruits below, which are winged, so very distinct fruits on the silver bells. And they are pretty much restricted to Massac and Pulaski County in Illinois along the Ohio River. There's one population I know of in Pulaski County that's extant, and it's pretty close to the Ohio River. And then in Massac County, they grow near metropolis, basically, also along the Ohio River. I think there's maybe 10 subpopulations total. So I've observed it, but I haven't been to all of those yet. We look at next here, we have Ameri uh, Styrax americanus, which is called Storax or American snowbell bush. <clears throat> that is what Styrax means. Styrax is Latin for Storax, and Storax is a, a name for a plant in uh, Europe where I, I think essentially it has the uh, resinous oils that were used for incense and uh, in various medicinal and herbal uses. So that's the meaning of the word storax. But I like to call it American snowbell bush. And you can see there it has, um, you know, mature individuals can have lots of flowers on them. White colored, so look like little snowbells. So this is a state threatened species. It's known from just 11 counties in Illinois. You can see them just you know, distributed here. Um, and I'll show another graph about that one later. We also have another Styrax in Illinois, <clears throat> Grandifolius, which is called the big leaf snowbell bush. And here's a picture of that species. So for a long time, there was just one known population in Alexander County. John Schwegman located it during his career as state botanist. But um, 2018 or 19, 
Uh, I believe Caleb Grantham actually was like looking at this shrub at another location and, and asked others <clears throat> about it. And I think Chris Evans and, and Nick Seaton and perhaps others were involved in uh, identifying the shrub at the time. It was in the winter, so there was no flowers or leaves, which made identification challenging. But they determined with the stacked buds, which I'll show a picture of here soon, that it was the uh, big leaf snowball bush. And that, so that was the second known location encountered in Illinois in Pope County. So Pope County is, you know, several counties away from Alexander County. So that's interesting distribution. We have two known uh, occurrences then for this rare shrub. And it's more, both of them are more in an upland woods where the Styrax americanus is definitely a wetland plant. So besides the fact that Grandifolius, as the name implies, has large leaves, um, they really don't occur in the same kind of habitat. Here's another picture of the beautiful flowers on the Styrax grandifolius. What's interesting is that the Alexander County population, if you look at the uh, flowering plants of Illinois, which is Dr. Mullenbrock's illustrated flora series, uh, he talks about the Alexander County population perhaps being sterile because no fruits are ever really found. But these plants in Polk County, tons of blooms, tons of plants, they, they are a clonal species, so they grow in these big clumps of clones. It would be interesting to see if um, there is viable fruit being produced. But in any event, we have those two occurrences for that rarity. And you can see distribution here. It's just so Bonap only has the Alexander County population mapped because the Pope County one is relatively recent. And I'd like to work with, uh, with uh, Dr. Cartes here to update the site. All right. So there are three other ones in North America that I don't know very well. Styrax. Uh, Platanifolius, right? Platanus is the uh, sycamore. So that's the sycamore leaf snowbell bush that grows in Texas and you know, only in Texas in the United States. And then we have another styrax called the California styrax, which is those only in California. And then lastly, styrax japonicus is the Japanese snowbell bush, as the name implies, is native to Asia, but is used as an ornamental. And um, according to Bonab, was only in um, the Northeast part of the United States. But interestingly, there was an old Jackson County record. I was not able to track down any Jackson County Styrax. And uh, in the flora of Southern Illinois, Dr. Mullenbrock mentions that um, it was a collection, I think, by French, George French. And uh, he thought it was the cultivated uh, Styrax and not Americanus, which would make sense because there's not really appropriate habitat in Jackson County. And I was unable to locate it there. So anyway, that's the Styracaceae in North America. I also want to mention that um, it's interesting if you look at the Illinois Endangered Species list, this plant is listed as Styrax americana. Um, not sure if that's what it says in, in the flora of Southern Illinois, but I found this interesting paper cited here that talking about, they actually looked into um, what the correct name use should be and concluded that this genus Styrax, just like Panax, where they end in X, should be treated as masculine with the appropriate masculine epithet ending. So U.S. is the masculine ending. So according to this research, the name is correctly Styrax americanus, which is interesting to note. So characteristics about the plant, this is a shrub, um, and they often grow in dense clumps, but they also can grow in single stems. The um, basically they're they're mostly entire leaves, but they can have sporadic teeth. You can kind of see some of the teeth there on the, the photo on the right. And the photo in the middle shows the stacked buds. It's a little hard to see. It's a little blurry. I was trying to take this photo with my hand lens, which is a tricky operation uh, with the camera. But you can see two distinct buds there above the leaf scar. So stacked buds, that's distinct for Styrax. And then uh, also it has stellate hairs. So stellate is like starry. They're like uh, branched hairs in little, little tufts, basically. So that is a useful characteristic. You can see the fruits as well. You know, they're singular, they're globose, they're fairly small. Um, but the leaves are petiolate and elliptic to oblong or ovate, glabrous or nearly so. So I always feel like the alternate leaved entire margin glabrous uh, leaved plants are not that distinct. And so it would suggest that this may be a hard 
shrub to identify. And when I was first learning the vegetation of, of Illinois, I always felt good if I could find some fruits and I knew for sure it was Styrax. Of course, now I've looked at so many plants and, and know the vegetation well that to me, they're distinct um, just with the leaf shape, but they do have some variability. Uh, lastly, I will mention the flowers are perfect and they are solitary or in short racemes. They have five white petals and they're pleasantly fragrant which is always a joy in the field. So some of the survey methods here. So this is, as I said, like a wetland shrub, shrub swamp, swamp species. It's actually quite um, variable in where it grows. It seemed to be like it was mostly in areas where it was really wet, standing water wet. Of course, it depends on what time of year you're there, whether or not there's water. If you go in May, which is ideal because that's when they bloom and not only are they beautiful and fragrant, they're easy to locate. Uh, typically, the water levels are a little higher that time of year. And we did see plenty of Styrax americanus growing in the standing water, uh, which makes for challenging surveying. But we also observed lots of Styrax in mesic to wet mesic to wet floodplain forests. So really a very variable soil moisture for where the species will occur but there's some pictures of surveying for it. And what's really kind of interesting is um, all the data was collected and entered into the Plants of Concern database. And that is easily done with the mobile app. So you can see a couple of volunteers in the picture there, as well as a uh, friend and colleague, Travis Neal, entering data into the phone app in the field, which makes data collection uh, really slick. So what are the things that we are collecting? Um, essentially here, we're going to, list the spatial extent of the plants using GPS. And with the app, you basically can go to the four corners of the population and drop GPS points and get sort of a polygon uh, out of that spatial data. Of course, we're gonna count plants and depending on the species, uh, it depends how the count is performed. And for this, we actually counted stems. For the most part, uh, counted stems at all the locations. We also want to figure out how many are reproductive. So we're separating sterile from reproductive stems so we can get a percent uh, reproductive. And then the dominant native plant species that co-occur with the Styrax are the dominant native associates. Uh, of course, we're looking at the invasive plants that may be uh, growing nearby or within the subpopulation. So those are recorded and the extent of the infestation is, is listed. And then as well as other impacts, which is often um, has to do with beaver or hydrology, various things, invasive species, and then ev evidence of management, which is usually thinning and burning, which hasn't really occurred. You know, the, the, the swamp, pretty much any natural community in Illinois will have burned historically, but as you can imagine, the wetlands typically don't burn very often. They're harder to burn. Uh, so we didn't really see much uh, management effects at any of the populations. I also want to mention with these maps here that so the idea with the project was to visit known sites that had polygons that were already mapped in GIS. And so the idea was to go to the known polygon, which is the gray, the circle with uh, in gray with the blue outline and see if it could find Styrax within the polygon. And if there was more found outside the polygon, then I tried to do my best to survey the entire area of suitable habitat. In some areas, um, I'm not sure I got to all the suitable habitat, but I definitely hit uh, the polygons and then any adjacent areas. So you can see in the photo on the left, that was up in Hamilton County. The green means it's an IDNR site. And I found plants within the polygon and plants actually scattered um, throughout uh, or outside of the polygon as well. So that was good additional data. And you can see my tracks there. In, in orange. And then the, the site on the to the right here is uh, up in Lawrence County. And this one was interesting because you see the little little gray circle right in the middle. That was the polygon that was mapped. And you can see with our tracks that we went into that area. We did not find any Styrax within the polygon uh, that was mapped. But you can see by all the red, red dots, that's where we did find Styrax Americana. So pretty much throughout the site, as well as, you know, off of the site onto uh, the adjacent landowner, but not exactly within that polygon, which I found uh, kind of interesting, but really shows that we were adding a lot of uh, better spatial data to the database. 
for this. A couple of other examples. <clears throat> so the Faulkner Tract is another IDNR site. You can see sort of well that there were, I think, five uh, little gray circles that indicate the polygons where Styrax was recorded in the past. And you can see that we didn't find any Styrax in those little polygons. One of them is on the other side of the Cache River. So <clears throat> that's challenging to cross. I was not able to, to get over to that one. But the other ones thoroughly searched, did not find Styrax in the polygons that were mapped, but I did find it uh, outside of those areas with the red dots. Um, and I put a little buffer around the, the points there. That's why they're buffered with, with the blue, light blue. But you see that there were other species that were rare that I found in there. And I, I blanked them out intentionally on the on the legend because these are rare plants. You don't want to be too vocal about where they are occurring. Uh, but I wanted to give you an idea of the distribution of sort of other things that were often found while searching for styrax. And then the polygon on, or the map on the right there shows down near Karnak. Some of the polygons were huge. You can see it's almost half of the entire section. So a section 640 acres. So, you know, that's 320, if not 350 acres worth of uh, surveying for Styrax. So you can see where, we, where the tracks are, all the red spots are where we found Styrax. So we're getting, again, better distribution data because the areas outside of our tracks were, were not suitable habitat for Styrax. So we're definitely getting uh, more precise location information um, out of this project. Speaking of which, I wanna mention the occurrence data. So for my report, I had to list uh, all of the occurrence data through time for each occurrence. And if we look here, we can see it says species, you know, start from the bottom. It says species observed, species observed, you know, Rick Philippi, um, Larry Stritch, two specimens, species observed, species observed, 10 plus plants, Mark Basinger, um, John White, two plants. Okay, so not all the times are these areas being surveyed, are they actually being censused? Just individuals are found, they're recorded, maybe specimens are obtained, and that's all great information. But with this project, we were actually updating by doing a census. So you see the top line says 505 stems, 21% flowering in sub pop one, 1,090 stems, 22% flowering in sub pop two. So we're gathering much better data, not only with the spatial distribution, but also with the population size and reproductive uh, potential. So that's terrific. Uh, the project for in totality, I counted um, with the help of others, 13,871 stems, but I had two sites that had thousands and thousands of stems that I didn't even bother counting. I just said thousands of stems. So that 13,871 stems, that's definitely an estimate on the low side. So we found a lot, <laughs> definitely found a lot. It's the kind of thing that after two years of surveying for it, I kind of feel like if I never see this plan again in my life, that might be just fine. <laughs> but odds are I will encounter it uh, Again, and it is a lovely plant, but I've seen my fair share of them. Of course, it's always important when out in the field to get selfie with the rare plant. And I took that opportunity whenever I could. And so I thought, um, so we we're going to dive into the nitty gritty of the project, really, and look at some of the occurrence data that was collected. So here's a nice stand of Styrax americanus. It, it often grows in big clumps like that with many stems and many mature stems. And basically for this project, the data that I was interested in updating had was came from the IDNR Natural Heritage Database. So there are, you know, there's somewhat of a variety of sources that can be used, uh, literature or herbarium specimens or word of mouth, et cetera. But the focus of the project was really to update the polygon data that was current in the IDNR Natural Heritage Database. So that includes uh, 23 EOs, and an EO is an element of occurrence. So I like to think of an EO as a site. So we think of like Styrax americanus, you know, at Heron Pond, that's one EO. Well, we might find three separate subpopulations at, in that Heron Pond area. So we would say we have three subpopulations within the one EO. I don't really like to think about them as EOs because an EO could have one polygon or it could have 14. We actually 
speaking of the Heron Pond occurrence, there were 14 polygons in mapped in the database for that cash or the upper cash river region um so i would prefer to think of populations as in the terms of subpopulations distinct subpopulations so tracking these by eos is a little bit apples to oranges and, and it was confusing but i'm trying i'm trying to do my best here to summarize the results for you in a way you, you can understand them so 23 EOs, and in the database, 11 were listed as verified extant, which meant that someone had visited them within the last uh, 10 years and updated it. But then there were 11 that were historical, meaning they had not been visited in more than 10 years. And then there was one listed as extirpated, which is locally extinct. It was wiped out, no longer occurring at the at one site. So that makes our 23 EOs that I that's the data that I had to work with and move to update. So what did I find uh, after the two year project, the 23 EOs, I verified 10 as extant. They were verified extant. I confirmed them verified extant. You saw previously there were actually 11 that were listed as extant. There was one I was not able to go to um, that was in that category because it was private land and I couldn't couldn't track down the land owner, couldn't get permission. Uh, but six of them were listed as historical, hadn't been visited in some time, and six were updated as confirmed extant. So that's great data to add. Um, the confirmed one that was extirp extirpated, I confirmed it was definitely extirpated. It was a farm field. So that site was wiped out, annihilated, no longer present. I did have one that I failed to find. So I searched, didn't find it. Appropriate habitat was there. So I'm not going to proclaim it extirpated. Uh, although we did a thorough search, and if it was there, I believe we would have found it. Uh, and then there were five sites that I was not able to visit. They were also privately owned. In fact, one of them, I was denied access. The other four um, were not able to get permission to go on the property. But in addition to those, we located seven additional elements of occurrence representing 10 new subpopulations. So with my work through Plants of Concern, I encountered Styrax americanus at new sites. I also had other people encounter them at new sites that I went and monitored as well. So it was really terrific to add a lot of data to the database. So in total, we had 30 elements of occurrence uh, representing 48 subpopulations in 10 counties. So that's a lot, that's a lot of subpopulations, a lot of plants, like I said, probably, you know, over 20,000 stems uh, total. I spent 46 days uh, monitoring for a total of 323 monitoring hours with myself and assistants and volunteers included in that number. So a lot of time spent looking for Styrax americanus. Here's a map here that shows the spatial distribution then. So essentially the blue and the green are the extant and new subpopulations listed. It's kind of hard to see all the points because I, I wanted to make them large enough so that you could see them on the map and some of them are overlapping. So some of them are hard to see, but that gives you a, a basic idea of the distribution of plants. Be sure to notice the green dot up in Kankakee County. So that's a disjunct population that was visited and was confirmed extant. And then the three counties in red, those were various sources that indicated uh, Styrax was reported there. No specimens could be found. They were not in the database. There was no other information. And I couldn't figure out where they were located in the wild, if they were even legit. So I colored, colored them in red as historical, but odds are they were, in, in my estimate, probably not ever uh, true Styrax Americanus populations present there. Um, I did hear about a couple other ones with uh, herbarium specimens. So I tried to get to all of them as much as I could. And like I said, I had a few private sites I didn't make it to. Some other notes on observations. Um, like I said, they often grow real stemmy with lots of stems and clumps. They, they definitely connect underground. So I did count stems, even though there may be multiple, more than one stem per individual. Um, they're easiest to monitor in mid-May, like second, third week in May is when they bloom. However, there's reproduction, reproductive individuals was on the low side. I think it was about 20% collectively speaking. 
Also interesting, as you can see in this picture here, is that the leaves kind of turn this yellowish color in the fall. So this, uh, the picture here was taken on uh, November 11th, 2021. And there are other things in the woods that are kind of yellowing too, but it just, it really, it catches your eye. I felt like if you can't go when they bloom, if you go late in the year, late October, early November, they're really easy to spot, um, as you can see in this photo. Uh, also that typically only the large populations are reproductive. We had a lot of, we had, we had several populations where only a few individuals were encountered and they were all sterile, just young or, um, you know, non-reproductive. And then also there's a number of similar species that kind of jumped out while doing Styrax surveys. A, a, a common one that looked like it was ash, Fraxinus. And you think, ash has opposite leaves. Ash has compound leaves. How did you confuse that with Styrax? Well, just the color and the form would look like it. And you'd, of course, you'd go closer and look and realize, okay, that's, that's an ash. That's not it. So it was funny how often ash seemed to be a trickster. Spice bush, Lindera was another one, but Lindera will grow nearby, but it typically doesn't like it as wet as Styrax. So there was a site where we found them fairly close together, but generally speaking, if you are observing uh, spice bush, the Styrax is not, your, it's too dry. You need to go into wetter habitat. Um, hickories, hickories would also look like it. And then Itea, which is Virginia sweet spire, uh, grows in the same habitat, has alternate leaves, but they have fine teeth. Uh, along the edges. So they're easy to distinguish that way. So a number of lookalikes that made monitoring uh, a little bit challenging having to look closer. So let me just go through uh, alphabetically by county and fill you in with uh, what the results were. Alexander County, here's the wonderful habitat that Styrax often occurs in. It can be quite wet. Um, really, really, uh, swamps are my favorite. I love swamps. And so I find these these areas fun to explore. Um, probably not the, the way the average person would look at it. But in Alexander County, there's a number of populations around Horseshoe Lake, within Horseshoe Lake and around Tams in that area. So we had 10 subpopulations in Alexander County. You know, this is the farthest southwestern county. So it's in the coastal plain. It makes sense. There would be lots of subpopulations there. There was one occurrence in Crawford County. We went up there and spoke to the landowner, and she said, no, she was very friendly. But she basically said, leave and don't come back. So we were not able to get to that site, which is a shame because that was the only known location in Crawford County that we could not verify as extant. So uh, 11 counties were known historically for Styrax Americanus. Uh, we confirmed the extant in 10 of them because we couldn't get to this site in Crawford County. But I did look at the occurrence data and it indicated that the species had not been seen since 2010 at this site and that there had been three surveys since then so you know it had been looked for and not found so I, that makes me feel like maybe it wasn't so bad it didn't get there it was unlikely that perhaps it was there still anyway which is a bummer because like i said that was the only crawford county location now in hamilton county there was just one site in the database but jenny lesko found another one so we had two and the site that jenny found um, was privately owned woods and it was the dominant understory shrub. It was I, un remarkable. I've never seen anything like it. We did not even attempt to count them. You see in the picture here in the understory, the, the sort of greenish yellowish leaves there on that shrub, That's those are all Styrax. And it was like that throughout acres and acres uh, of Styrax Americanus. Uh, really, really wild uh, to see that. So, in fact, I actually found um, county record Carrick's Intumescens at that site, as well as county record uh, IT of Virginica, the Sweet Spire. So that was an interesting site. It would be great to see, see it obtained and protected. Then Johnson County, there's a lot of spots in Johnson County. I wanted to show uh, this map as well. Whoops. Um, this is shows that this is a large site, and we found a lot of other rare plants there listed in addition to the Styrax americanus. And of course, this is the same habitat that cottonmouths like. You can see the cottonmouth there. In fact, they even took this video. They do the defense posture of opening their mouth to warn you. A little too close to comfort, some people might think, but in my experience, cottonmouths, they just sit there. They're not interested. So you leave them alone, they leave you alone. 
but we are in the habitat for cottonmouths. In fact, um, Gretel Kiefer and some of her colleagues came down to to help survey, and this is us at Grantsburg Swamp, which is my one of my favorite sites now. Lots of styrax there, lots of fun surveying. We saw five cotton mouse that day, and of course you're in and out of the water, uh, so that's perhaps not for everybody. But uh, we enjoyed it. In fact, we saw two things there that I've never seen before. One is this uh, wild lettuce, Nebulus crepidinus, crepidinus. I've never seen it flowering before. Never seen it flowering since, but it was it was there at Grandsbury Swamp. And then this wild looking sphinx moth caterpillar was on Ludwigia leptocarpa, which is really wild and neat looking. So lots of other neat, fun observations to make while out looking for styrax. And another fun um, monitoring event here with Travis Neal, we biked to a population. There was some a subpopulation along Tunnel Hill Trail, and we were, you know, trying to make quick work of things, had a lot on our agenda for that day. So we actually biked in on the trail to find Styrax, which we did. And one of my favorite pictures of Travis, the rare picture of him smiling with the Styrax in full bloom, which I, I believe was the first time that he had seen this in bloom. <clears throat> so definitely a reason to be happy. And you can see standing water there is where Styrax often does occur. And in, so in total in Johnson County, we had 12 subpopulations, uh, mostly around the Cache River region, the upper and lower Cache. So the southern half of Johnson County is definitely a stronghold for Styrax Americanus. And then up in Kankakee, this uh, was a site found, uh, it's in the Moments Wetlands. Bill Glass and Fran Hardy found this in 1985. This is all ID&R land now. Some of it's nature preserve. And you can see the wetlands pictured there. So we did not find as much <clears throat> uh, populations there as historically, but we did find some. So we were able to confirm as extant Styrax Americanus in Kankakee County, which was exciting and fun to travel up there to see those. Then Lawrence County, we had one population there. So a little drier of a site here. Of course, we were late there later in the year and it was a really dry year. This was in 2020. 20, 2022, sorry, this is last year. It was really dry in the fall. So you can see the picture there, but plenty of Styrax. Again, here's here's often the scene we would find late in the year, those yellowish leaves, lots of little sterile stems throughout the woods. So they're not too hard to find. We just had the one sub, subpopulation in Lawrence County. And then in Massac, um, <clears throat> it's interesting. I found a lot of sterile stems down at Mermet Swamp. They weren't uh, found within the polygon where they were mapped, but I found a new population at the northern end of the site. So I don't know if that was mapped incorrectly or whatnot, but it was good to, to, to at least document that plants did occur at that nature preserve. In fact, in Massac County, we had seven subpopulations total. So it was good to update that data. And then in Polk County, <clears throat> so in southern Polk, Polk County is where you get the swamps. So most of Polk County is sandstone cliffs and, and canyons and upland forests. But in the southern part of the county, there's actually a private landowner that, that has a, a lot of intact wetland um, communities. And we found thousands and thousands of Styrax, many clumps of mature individuals. Now, we went there in July, so they weren't full bloom. I'd love to return when they were flowering. I bet it's a sight to see. But that was a fun sight to be able to to monitor. I also want to mention that uh, there was a site in Polk County called Round Pond that the Illinois Natural History Survey botanists, they surveyed the whole site in 2019, including all the Styrax Americanus locations. So since I did have a lot to do for this project, I did not revisit Round Pond. I just took the data from 2019 and added that to my report since it was fairly current. So that is a good site for them there. So just the two subpopulations in Polk County. And then Pulaski, Pulaski County is along the Ohio River, a lot of wetlands, the lower cache goes through this region. So lots of populations in Pulaski County, a total of nine subpopulations listed there. In fact, um, <clears throat> one of the sites was a site that I found in 2010, where I was um, doing the INAI update work. And so that was interesting that I, I found this population in 2010. No one had updated it since. So it was kind of nostalgic to go back. 
sort of interesting story there is that when I was looking at my pictures from 2010, I noticed a picture of a sedge that I did not label. And, you know, in 2010, I was still learning. I'm still learning now, of course, but 2010, I was a little greener, especially with uh, Carex ID. So I found a picture uh, in my collection from 2010 that was of Carex lupuliformis. So I was really excited about that. I actually went back to the site a second time after I found that photo to find the Carex lupuliformis, which we found and also found Carex gigantea, which is a new location for that rare Carex. So that was really fun. A little sleuthing there. Uh, for that. And then speaking of sleuthing in Union County, there's one sub subpopulation. I had two other teams of botanists visit this site for Styrax tw two times, and neither of them were able to locate any. And I thought, wow, this is the only site in Union County. I want, like, what happened? Like, is it there? I really wanted to document it. It's still there. So I dug up and looked into it, you know, and I found I had found it there in 2010 and turned in the report. So I went through my photos and lo and behold, I find a, ma a mature individual with fruit. And I think th these have to be there. There's no way they're just gone. So I went back the third visit uh, and we were able to find a bunch of plants there. So we were able to confirm uh, that the plant was present still in Union County. This is actually at Hickory Bottoms, which is Cypress Creek National Wildlife Refuge. So that was great to be able to get that county updated. And then lastly, Wayne County, we had a couple populations. I could, weren't able to visit them all. One, one of them was new though. Again, Jenny Lesko found the subpopulation along the interstate. So we went there as well as one other spot. So we had two subpopulations in Wayne County. So that gives you the occurrence data by county. I also want to mention some of the threats that make this species somewhat rare, or at least was, was rare. Um, there's a lot of hydrology changes. So presumably the species, it was much more widespread, particularly in Hamilton County. You know, we found that large subpopulation, but this is what it looks like in that county. It's all drained and cleared for farmland. And we, there were actually two sites in the database where the polygons were completely uh, within farmland that had been created since they were um, documented. So Farmland, agriculture is a big threat. Hydrology changes. So some of these sites that it seemed like they were growing a little more drier of an area than at other sites may be due to hydro hydrological alteration. Um, also, something interesting I noticed was falling woody debris. So it, these are forest, you know, these grow in the forest and large limbs would fall and pin down a limb of the Styrax and it would be completely held to the ground. And in a number of cases, it would reroute and just keep growing. So apparently the, the woody debris wasn't really necessarily negatively affecting uh, the, the stands because they did continue to grow. But we found a lot of stems that were pinned down by falling debris. And then lastly, a fair amount of beaver damage. You think a beaver wouldn't mess around with the, you know, these are re relatively small stems. I would say, God, probably under two inches in, in circumference. Um, and the yet the um, the beaver were chewing on them and in fact chewing them off in some cases so that was interesting to observe and then of course invasive species this this is the best picture i have for uh, stilt grass microstegium viminium it's growing in a pine stand so obviously this isn't styrax habitat but th this is how stilt grass grows sometimes in these dense monocultures and obviously that's going to impact other plants that are occurring there i also saw um, at another site, just the whole understory was almost completely taken over by Acaranthes japonica, the Japanese chaff flower. So that obviously is going to impact things as well. Multifloral rose was common additionally. And then Lysimachia numularia, which is the moneywort, some people consider invasive. It seems to me that it's just so common in, in wetlands, and particularly little muddy depressions that it doesn't, I don't know how much of that it really inhibits growth by other the native vegetation, but it was commonly found um, in wetlands where Styrax occurs. So recommendations here. Um, it is recommended here that this species be delisted in Illinois because not only is it not likely to become endangered in the wild in Illinois in the foreseeable future, but there are over 15 EOs scattered across more than eight counties within three natural division sections. So that meets the criteria outlined in the recovery plan 
uh, for this species to be recovered. And so I think that 30 EOs in 48 subpopulations in 10 counties, several natural divisions, um, suggest that this species is stable in Illinois and does not warrant listing. So the 2025 Endangered Species Protection Board list review is uh, cur about to begin. It, it takes so long to go through all the all the groups that you know they start them in advance. So um, for the 2025 review re or the revision, I'm going to petition to delist this species based on how common it is now. I will mention here that there were other rare species encountered. In fact, 20, 20 other rare plant species were encountered during the Styrax surveys. Um, and that represented actually 76 occurrences. So we added a heck of a lot of additional data of other rare plant species into the database through surveys for Styrax americanus. Now, not all of the species in this list are state threatened or endangered. Some of them are regionally rare, but they are all tracked by the Plants of Concern program. In fact, one of them, the Hydrolia uniflora, was listed at this site and it had not been seen in so long it was it was considered possibly extirpated. And while studying for or while surveying for Styrax americanus, we found the Hydrolia uniflora. In fact, I it was not flowering and it's it's you know, when you're a botanist, I guess everything looks distinct, but some of the plants don't jump out as well as others when they're, especially when they're not blooming. And so I was listing the Styrax associates um, at the site and lo and behold, there was hydrolia growing at the base of it. So we returned there last year when it was flowering and did a census for that rare plant. So that was re more really good data to update from this project. And then lastly, I will mention that you know, we re recorded native species that were associates with the Styrax. And this included a number of things, but as the two pictures show, there's the lizard's tail, Sarurus cernuus on the left, and then the Scutellaria lateriflora is the mad dog skull cap, one of the best common names ever. Uh, but also lots of white spot milkweed, false nettle, inland oats, rose mallow, rose mallow uh, rice cut grass, marsh, uh, St. John's wort. You know, we had trees were mostly red maple, water tupelo, various oak species, bald cypress. We had uh, forestiera, which is uh, swamp privet, button bush. You know, those are all native associates that were encountered and listed on the monitoring reports for the Styrax occurrences. So there you have it. There is the discussion of Styrax americanus in Illinois. As I said, it was quite a fun project to complete over the two years. There is a 60 page report that I wrote that went to the Illinois Native Plant Society and the IDNR, which further discusses uh, more details. But this is was basically the gist of it that I was happy to have a chance to present to the group. So with that, I will go ahead and open it up for any questions.